prepare this. I, I outlined this agenda. It's better. It's a bit of basic uh, stuff that we probably need to discuss. Uh, as Catherine suggested in Slack, I believe it's. I think it's a good starting point to take a look at where we are at the moment, uh, both from the position of what current epics do we have, because there's quite a few of them actually, and a couple of issues um, which don't belong to epics, I believe. And then what, what, are, what is actually the problem with onboarding that we're trying, trying to solve? If we manage to talk about these two things today, that would be great. And then moving forward, I think maybe it's good uh, to kind of break it down into different kinds of users that GitLab serves. And then I wrote out, wrote out a few questions. What are the goals that they want to achieve by using GitLab? What will increase the likeliness of them properly adopting GitLab? Because we know that, as I understand, we don't have a really good adoption of the product. Uh, that's one of the main problems that we want to solve. Um, and then when I was looking into onboarding and you know the basics of onboarding, everyone suggests that one of the key things to do is to make users really comfortable with the core feature features that the product you know enables you to do that the, the product has. And for us, that might be you know creating projects, creating groups, putting projects into groups, and some basic stuff like that. But that should be like the simplest possible, the, the least friction possible we can have there, the better. So they don't need to focus on that so that they can come in, feel like they already know what to do or feel like that very soon after signing up. And then they can focus on the things that we want to show them, maybe the more advanced features as well. Um, yeah, then the aha moment. What is the aha moment for each of those users? Do we need something separate for you know these personas, or do we need a bit of a generic onboarding, something that kind of fits everyone? Maybe, yeah, I mean that's up for the discussion, right? And yeah, in the end, just what are the key things that our new onboarding should do? Uh, something that I want to also discuss is how do we measure our success because we do need to we need a way to measure it. Uh, otherwise, we won't know if we're successful or not. And yeah, in the end, maybe a couple of next steps. Uh, something that I already, I already suggested that I will start working on next week is I will um, you know, try to map out the current journey of users uh, that they go through as it is today. It, does, it doesn't really make sense for all of us to be involved in that because a single person can do that easily. I think where we should come together and where we are the strongest as a group is generating new ideas and putting knowledge from all, all of us together, trying to understand the users and what they want to do and how can we design the new better boarding. I'm sorry because you guys can't really see me. <laughs> it's such strange lighting in my room. <laughs> but that's, that's pretty much it. So if you go to the epics, if you haven't yet, uh, there's one that you, Jeremy, started, which only has two issues. And should I share my screen or something? Maybe it's a good idea. Yeah, yeah that'd be good. Uh, let's do this. This. So while you're sharing your screen, um, I think everything you said makes sense. I think that I don't know if we need to, in the first iteration, have everything built for every type of user that wants to come into GitLab. But like, I think should we should kind of have an idea and a framework for which users and which use cases we want to eventually build up for. Um, but I think that all that all makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the approach. Um, you know, you, you mentioned like there are different use cases for different users that join GitLab. Um, and that's definitely something that we should, uh, we should discuss and think through. So, yeah. 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 Cool. I agree. Um, so we need some good improvements. I agree. We need some good improvements, you know, a bit more generic maybe. And then can we look in further iterations? Can we maybe add a bit of customization to the whole process? Maybe it makes mm -hmm. sense. Maybe it doesn't. Let's explore that. So yeah, the first onboarding that I uh, onboarding epic that I opened on top was this one. So this is quite a recent one. 
uh, started by you, Jeremy. Selling yeah. proof of onboarding experience for a new user and expose new users to the DevOps stages groups during onboarding. Yeah, so this epic, the intent of it was to capture the, um, the work items and issues that kind of come out of this exploration. And the reason I have those two issues in this epic um, is basically in the agenda, I wrote down like under 2A, like what I think the scope of the onboarding should be. Um, at least my initial ideas. Um, and then the, so those two issues kind of represent that. The first is like having an onboarding experience that directs them to some like early magic moment where right now we see people don't really understand how to use GitLab. We have this like four panel thing where it's like create a new project. I think it's join a group, uh, create a group, like explore. Um, and then there's like settings or something. I can't remember. Um, very basic, very bare bones, and people don't really stick around or engage with that to a, to a large degree. So creating some type of user, type of experience that directs them to like a magic moment, like finding another project, creating a group, creating a project, or something along those lines. And then the other issue in that epic was exposed to the DevOps stages during the, yeah, that's, that's the, the thing that I'm, that I'm, that yeah. I'm referring to. So when you gen when you start a, uh, when you join gitlab.com or another, or a GitLab instance, register a user, this is the first page that's presented to you. And then once you create a project, then you just see the project dashboard as your default experience. So that's kind of how that works right now. Um, um, so the other thing that I, the other, other issue was exposed to the DevOps stages. And the intent of that was GitLab is a very like, like wide product. It does a lot of things Ex like exposure and awareness of all the things GitLab does is relatively poor. So during the onboarding experience, consider how we might be able to tell the user, say like, Hey, GitLab does all these things start here um, to build awareness of like all the things that we can do and all the problems we can solve. But that's a secondary goal, I would say. Okay. Do you see this being done in the first iteration as well? I don't think so. Um, I, I think it's something, it's a goal worth considering, but I don't necessarily see it as part of the first iteration. There might be other, ex other opportunities for us to do this elsewhere. Like, um, like Catherine completed a great piece of UX research on like adding, like changing the nav to reflect the DevOps stages. And then I have like another proposal on how we might be able to do that. So there, there might be other opportunities throughout the product to be able to accomplish that. So that's probably not the primary goal. Yeah. I wonder if a first iteration could be to just change the copy on the bottom right, learn more about GitLab, just like making that more oriented to like wherever we want to start with the nine DevOps stages or just in general, because I know it goes to the documentation, but maybe it could go to somewhere specific about learning about DevOps and GitLab or something like that. Mm -hmm. We do have yeah. some stats on um, the new users that just joined uh, GitLab on GitLab.com, right? And it says 29% of them create a repository during the first session. So that's quite a lot. That would mean they click this bit here, right? I don't know if they click that. That means that they create that they created a project. So they maybe like found their way to that page. I actually don't know how okay. many people click on that button. Hmm. Is there a way we can find so we it? Find out. Ah, oh, we can. Okay. Yeah. I think it would be a good place to start just to see because there are four options here. What what is the thing that looks you know like the best next thing for them to do at this stage? Um, I assume it would be just create a project or create a group. Uh, but we can't be sure, right? Right. Right. Uh, I'm gonna jot that down. Because like I said, we should have the data. I just need to look it up. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, like could this be, like you wouldn't want it to be too long because maybe someone would abandon it, but could it just have like a progress bar at the top so they start by whatever logically makes sense? Like, I don't know, maybe it's creating a group then create a project and then it goes to quickly learn more about GitLab and it just yeah. kind of highlights those four different steps or should it just be 
So, so I, I think I think one of the problems that we have during this is that we have four competing um, options that none of them we're not encouraging the user to do any particular one. So I think one of the goals for us when we when probably Matei digs into the into the exploration is like, can we create a sense of progression? Can we like or like direct the user to like a specific thing that we want a journey that we want them to take instead of saying here are four things, pick whatever you want. Um, so maybe I think that that's, that's one of the, that's definitely something to explore, Catherine. But I, uh, I think one of the challenges is because people arrive at GitLab with different objectives. Some people want to like find a public project to contribute to. Some people have like pre-existing code. Some people, um, are maybe invited to a group or a project and they, but they don't really know how GitLab works. Um, the, it's hard, it's kind of challenging to create like a one size fits all for that. Whereas with other products, it's a little it's, bit more straightforward, but ours is so broad that it's like a little bit more hard, more challenging. So. Yeah, that's true. But I think it's a good, great call out. Maybe at some point they would actually choose their own path, <laughs> like, you know, in a, in a game <laughs> where you, yeah. where you select, I want to use GitLab for X. And then the onboarding kind of directs you into, you know, creating things that you would find valuable. So, so that's actually something I wanted to bring up when we got to it. Um, like in two a two one, I listed like a couple of examples to be able to solve that problem of like, hey, there's like GitLab does so many things, and we have different use cases. Whether it's like dot com and what they want to accomplish, self manage what they want to accomplish. Um, like some products will just like explicitly ask you, like, why are you here? What do you want to do? And have slightly different experiences for that, the, the new user experience, depending on what the user says. That is definitely something I would love to explore a little bit of like WordPress there. Like there's a onboarding walkthrough there where they will ask you like, Hey, what do you want to accomplish? And then they will kind of like tailor the experience for that. Um, and then also like Basecamp will like create a sample project for you if like, you, you know, cause like that's one of the first things that they do. Um, and I think like Asana does the same thing, which is just like, Hey, we just created a project for you. Here's all the things that like that this product does for you kind of like it allows you to kind of explore a little bit. But I like the idea of like maybe if, like defining like a few different paths to say like, here's like our future like vision for onboarding in GitLab. And it asks you like four quite like, you know, gives you four op options. Like, do you have existing, do you have like a, an existing project that you want to like, that you're moving over from like another, you know, application, you know, are you looking for like projects to contribute to, um, you know, are you like, I, 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 like we can enumerate the options and then have yeah. like specific paths for each one and maybe build out just one, um, and then kind of iterate. Mm. Yeah. That, that's interesting. Yeah. Just a thought. Yeah. That's exactly what I meant actually. Um, okay. Should we go to other epics? I, there are a couple, but the most important one is the one that you started, which is this one. And there's an older one from eight months ago, which has a bit more issues, but there are more, how can we improve this small bit here to improve the onboarding? And how can we improve that small bit there so that we can improve the onboarding, right? Um, weights are not explained well enough. For example, this is quite specific. It's not so, you know, the scope is not as wide as with the other epic with the other issues. Do we need, do we want to look at any of these in the next few milestones at all? Or do we, you know, do this later? So I had a chance to look at these. I think that these are all, for future milestones and these are like small little details to like include outside of this exercise i yeah. personally didn't see anything that was like you know this is really good we need to consider this in the great like longer onboarding journey all of these seemed quite specific and like probably not even for manage to work on like stuff like start an auto devops pipeline immediately one click improve onboarding for idea to production Weights are not explained. That's all. Those are like plan and they're like those are not for manage. So yeah. I think this epic should almost be kind of ignored. Okay. Yeah, I think this bit is. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. 
Sorry, I was going to say that I don't think this is managed either, but the conduct UX research on GitLab installation process, um, I think that's an important one, even though it's not onboarding. Um, I know that's the real pain point. So if we can get someone to prioritize that one, that'd be great. Yeah, ignore was a strong word. Like, I think that the problems that are in these issues are probably very relevant to what we're trying to accomplish with onboarding. Yeah. And I think that the UX research on the installation process is very, very helpful. I think that we obviously understand like .com better a little bit because of the fact that we all use it all the time. Um, you know, it's um, we have better data for it. So I think that you know self-managed is definitely something that um, you know we should understand well when we do this. Okay, yeah. and where did you see that, Chris? Were you still looking at the same? Editing? Yeah, it's the page Matei has opened. It's the, yeah. yeah, second to last one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And if you go to this issue where we have a bit of stats, you can actually see that 3.3% of users get stuck in the sign-up process. So they don't actually confirm their email and we have an issue for that, which is, again, very specific, how to change the email activation process. And this should help us completely resolve, you know, this and the 3.3% of people will actually sign up for GitLab uh, instead of getting stuck. Um, okay, but let's ignore this epic for now. Uh, there's another one. What is this? Uh, that's, that's an issue, okay. That's an issue for signing in and registration, and I believe you wrote a comment, Jeremy, right? Yeah, I just see yeah. this as a slightly separate problem. It's a little bit, and that's a little bit short-sighted because those two things are related, especially if we want to create onboarding, change our sign-in and registration like flow as part of onboarding, but I kind of see it as a separate problem to scope down the onboarding a little bit, which is like, Onboarding is like, I've registered, I, you just, I'm looking at GitLab for the first time as a registered user, I'm ready to start exploring the product, what do I see, what now? Yeah, okay, no, that's cool. I'm glad that we kind of cleared that out. So we have one epic that we want to focus on. Uh, these are the stats, this is the one. And these are the two issues. Cool, and we scheduled these two issues, right, for 11.9. Okay, this one is not scheduled yet. Okay. I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we want to include that as part of this, but um, I, I, I consider that kind of like a, a goal to keep in mind as we dig into the onboarding. But if we maybe yeah. split that out for future iteration, like we can discuss. Yeah. Okay, so if we want to look at the problems that we want to solve with this redesign of onboarding, and then which metrics do we use? Uh, let's try to you know, just come up with a few and then a metric that will tell us, okay, we, we improved on this. And I see you already had some comments here, Direct. The user to an early magic moment. Yeah, that's what you talked about. But hey, since you talked through some of the data, um, I'm wondering, let me, if you wouldn't mind, I'll just share a little bit of the existing data that we have. Yeah, and yeah what sure. We're able to know and, and not know right now. Yeah. So um, I, I, I create the, if you click on the link, that's the existing data. That's, um, that's kind of interesting. It leads you to, so the, I'm looking at two, perfect, thank you. So this is the dot-com metrics meeting. Um, so this is the, the diagram on the right is kind of how people, the conversion rates as people flow throughout the product. Um, and you see that, you know, you have 100% of people register only 82% of it make it to a successful login. So we lose 18% of people right there. Huh. Um, of those 82% of people, 35% um, of people will go on to create a project. Um, and right now we define activation as just the people that create a product. So in the 44% of people that aren't activating, like we don't, they might go on and like join another project, explore the private page and find like a open source project to contribute to. But overall, we, uh, we have pretty kind of like poor activation after like people go and successfully log in. So we have Snowplow data, so we don't have the ability to connect users across sessions. So, you know, if someone joins and then comes back a week later, we don't have a great way of connecting those. 
but we actually have a pretty good sense of like what people click on and what they what pages they're looking at like during their first session. So um, as we go along in this exercise, um, and there are things we're curious about, like you know, um, I added to the agenda like how are people using the existing onboarding panel, like what's the scale, and then what are the click through rates. We actually can get that data from GitLab.com. Um, with the understanding that this is .com only and it might be a little different for self-managed. So from the from a data standpoint, we actually um, we actually can lean on uh, on Snowplow quite a bit here. So that's all. Okay, and that reminds me actually, are we focusing on GitLab.com only, or is this going to translate into you know self-hosted instances as well? It has to be. It has to be both. Like I, okay. I, I think it has to kind of. Yeah, it has to be both, which I, which is why I think that like, you know, like the use case of someone finding like a public project and then you know, contributing to open source is like unique to .com, yeah. which it might not be the place to start. So we might want to start with more thing, things that are fundamental for .com and self-managed, like creating a project, joining a group, joining a project, and then iterating from there. Um, but I think that it, it kind of has to kind of has to you know, have an experience that works for both, ideally. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. So this is the existing data that we have. So what, what from this are we looking to improve? Activation, I would assume? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that there are two, there are three goals from a metric standpoint, um, which is, we create an onboarding experience, how many people like convert and like, actually complete it. Um, whatever starting point and ending point we have, we define like how many people actually convert, complete it. Um, number two, um, if there are additional things for people to go and do before they like are activated on GitLab, how many people complete that, go on to activate that complete the onboarding versus not. So, you know, for users that complete the onboarding, if we look versus those that do not, um, we should see like greater activation, um, ideally, um, and engagement with those users that complete onboarding. Number three is retention, which is like people that complete the onboarding, um, we should see them come back and return to use GitLab more, uh, more often and, be, and are more likely to become active users. So those are the three things that kind of come to mind for me. Okay, yeah, I wrote this down. Uh, how many people convert activation of users with onboarding versus the ones without? So how are we going to test this? Are we going to release it, release it only to, I don't know, 50% of users and compare? So I have a data. I, so I would, I, I think that we can do it both ways. I would like to do a B testing if we can. I asked, um, there's a issue that I'm starting and I asked Dennis like in a DM, like, what, like let's let's see if we can A/B test this. Like this is the one issue that I want to try to A/B test. So if we can do that, I think we should totally do it. Um, but if not, then we can do like a um, just filter out for users that have completed it versus those that have not, yeah. um, which won't which won't be as effective. Yeah. So I have a couple of questions. Um, so activation is it necessary to do stuff on the website? Uh, Sorry, creating issues. Are, uh, are people who have not activated their accounts able to uh, create issues and all that, or are they just so? When I out? say activate, like I, I, there's there there is you. It, it means like you're taking some kind of action on okay on so not email. that 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 yeah that 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 makes you an engaged user. So this is like a user that like just shows up on Git on a GitLab instance and then just kind of like clicks around and does nothing and they're like ah it's not for me and they leave. They're not really activated because they haven't really done anything in the instance except just like view a bunch of stuff. So we still haven't really defined what activation means. Um, but my point there on the second point was like if we have an onboarding experience that stops short and then says activation is like you doing all these things, you starting a pipeline, you create a board, you create an issue. Um, and we stop there. We stop ahead of those things where we're just like linking, I don't know, like linking documentation or like a guide, or you're just creating a project or something. Um, how many users then go on to do those things that we define as activation? 
um, I think that it would be much higher for those users that will that we like show the value of GitLab and allow them to explore. So again, activation is kind of this like fuzzy term that we haven't really defined yet. Um, but my point is is that those users that complete onboarding should go on and become highly engaged users more often than those that do not. And that's all that I was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense, thanks. And then my other question was, do we have data for previous months? Because if it's already consistent with that 44%, uh, maybe we can like skip A-B testing because we know that's how users behave with our current, uh, the way that it is. So I, I, I think that's, um, it's true, we do, we have run that for a while, so we do understand like how users are, um, I, I don't know what we're gonna be adding in like a future release, so I don't necessarily, I would prefer to A-B test because it gets us cleaner data and we don't confound like our own results by having this pre-post because we can like add a bunch of stuff in that release and then we're like, oh, as a result of like this or the site got faster or the site like crashed or like, well, you know, we got more unstable, like is it because of that? Um, and it becomes harder to answer those questions without it. So I prefer A/B testing, but like if we if we don't have it, we can we can we can probably manage. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Like we want to get the best data. Cool. So there was another thing that you mentioned here, which is an early magic moment. Do we? What, do, what could we say is the early magic moment for a generic GitLab user? Can we even say that we have one? This is the same thing as the aha moment, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think we have to like decide what we want to promote, right? Uh, because if we want users to create projects, then that would be the magic moment, right? Like they succeeded at that. Um, so it, I think it depends on what we want to, we want users to think of GitLab as, right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Cool. Because I mentioned the, where is it, aha moment later on as well. And I actually think that later on we'll probably find different magic or aha moments, whatever we want to call them for different personas, different types of users, whatever, how, however we decide to split the onboarding if we do. Um, so yeah, let's maybe just say for now, creating a project. Can we actually see if, they, if there's any activity then in those projects? Because if you just create a project and it's a blank project, you're not actually doing anything. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. Like most people are going to come to GitLab for uh, to have a repository, right? Like there are, there are going to be projects that only have issues and other stuff without code or files. But I think that the basic thing that you need to make GitLab work is to have one file, right? I would assume so. Yeah. Yeah. I so I, I feel like people either do they do a couple of things, right? Like they have some pre-existing project that they want to import from somewhere. Um, I would imagine that most people don't start from scratch. Um, um, so, you know, they, they have a blank project and they have code, so they want to get that onto GitLab. Or they have like, or they're like joining a self-managed instance that already exists and already has like lots of projects and groups and stuff. And they, are, they want to be able to contribute to what's already there. I would imagine that's probably more common because I'd imagine for self-managed, like you have, so you generally have, have like, you know, a group, an administrator or, or a core group of people that's that, and they know how they want to, they, they'll work with us or they know how they want to set up GitLab because they've used it before and they will like create like a structure for their groups and projects that is already on, this, on the instance. And they will invite more people to come join them. Um, so those people will then register for, for GitLab and then what? And then like, they need to find how to use the product. They need to find those projects and groups that they need to contribute to. So how do we kind of help them do that? I think that is the part that is a little bit more hey, fuzzy for me, like how we do that. And that's more instruction and hard. Like this, like if you're just like a new user on .com, I think that we can create like a pretty easy, like, you know, simple new project funnel, like here, create, get, get your stuff into GitLab. 
you click on new project, we have issues for like a better blank state and then a better like uh, experience for like how you get your code or how you import code and uh, using templates that I think is all great. But I think that the question for me is like, I just joined an existing pre, pre uh, self managed instance or like I'm like invited by my, um, you know, into a group by like my enterprise on .com. Now I'm here. What the hell do I do? Okay. Does that make sense at all? Like, am I? I think it does. I think the three areas of focus are a good place to start. Uh, we're a bit fuzzy on the magic moment part, but maybe we can articulate it a bit better as I, we. I think it's. I think it's like I don't know for that user. Like I don't know yeah. what the magic moment is for them. I I would guess that it is like you know, finding whatever they're supposed to do in GitLab and being able to have a clear idea of like how to do it, whether that is like contributing code or like finding an issue board or something. Um, I don't, I, I, I don't know what aspects of the product that new users that are joining existing instances typically engage with um, or what questions they're trying to answer. I don't know what the magic moment is for that user. Yeah. I think in a, in a less magical way, I guess from our perspective, um, like I saw in the other epic, a point where it said, I think just going from creating a project or um, to like discovering CI or something like that, using CI, I saw that as a bullet point in one of the, the epics, but maybe it's just things like that. like Getting through the barrier of figuring out what you're supposed to do in GitLab and then finding those features that make your job really easy or contributing to finding the projects that are really interesting to you. Like, I think it could have different um, meanings for different people. Like Jeremy said. Yeah. Also to be clear, when I, when we say the word magic moment, like I always think of magic moments as like, it's a moment in the user early user journey that drives like an outsized amount of like user stickiness where they see like the value of the product so clearly where that like users that do this versus those that do not like, return and like um, convert at a much higher rate. For Facebook, as I recall, this was like, if you could get someone to add like seven friends within 10 days, people would, all, would almost always return for their second session because like that was how you demonstrated the value of their product. Like you got people to join, the network effects were strong, and then you, uh, you just, you, so they knew to funnel people towards that goal. Um, for us, it might be creating a project within like your first week or like uh, creating an issue or like some type of, you know, whether or engaging with an existing product, pro a project or group within like, you know, uh, you know, a week or something. But um, we'll probably have a similar magic moment um, depending on the user, like, uh, like you said, Catherine. Yeah. Yeah, that was a really good explanation for me that I really showed me what you meant. Sorry, I know we've been throwing around terms like magic moment and aha moment, so sorry for not explaining that more. No, that makes sense. It just, it still gives me the feeling that if possible, somehow funneling the users maybe is what makes sense. Like, I don't know if it's as explicit as choosing. I am a security analyst and going down a different path, but it seems like there's a lot to discover, so if we can make it easier for them to discover something relevant to them, but also have the option to see other things out there. Seems like that's a sweet spot, maybe. Okay. Yeah, as we start talk, talking about users, I have a full point for users, and it kind of aligns to the what problems with onboarding are we trying to solve, and then for which users. And Catherine, you'll, you'll probably know most of this stuff because you speak to a lot of users um, and this also depends on when or whether we go down the path of defining different onboarding for different personas something that I think would be cool to know is at least to get a, a, an idea of the types of users that are on gitlab.com and what they will use gitlab for like the main primary you know thing as you said, maybe someone is uh, a security analyst. What actually do they do with GitLab? And if, the, if there are, how many other security analysts are using GitLab on gitlab.com? And then what are the other typical 
you know, personas that use GitLab.com and what is the division in percentages. So maybe we, we can pick one of them that is a bit more generic and it has the largest percentage and design for that. Does that make sense? Yeah. The one thing that kind of worries me there, I feel, at least from my research, because we usually ask the question about their role and then um, the type of, the, like the tier they're on and things like that, it often tends to be software engineers on GitLab, like responding to us. And I'm not sure if, because we have so many other like um, product offerings that we're trying to bring in. I'm not sure if that'll create friction with that objective. Like if it turned out to be just software engineers primarily concerned with like source code management, that kind of thing. I don't know. Mm. But I can definitely go back and look through the data that I've already collected in each of those studies and kind of see if what the trend is. And then do you think there's another way that we can collect anything related to that? Like in any of the tracking? Or no, I don't think we asked that question anywhere. Do we ask that question anywhere in the process? I was going to ask you, do, maybe we could just run a survey or something. Yeah. Um, I guess in terms of that, we ask that question a lot. Okay. So I might already have data on it, like yeah. just aggregated. So I'll, I'll think about this question and see the, the best way to handle it. That's good. Okay. Yeah, it would, be, it would be nice to at least have some focus on some sort of persona, which is maybe a bit more generic. Maybe it's the software engineer, as, as you mentioned um, them. And it is designed for those first and go into more specific stuff later on. Yeah, and I think we actually answered this bit up there in two, right? Show the scope of the application and everything it can do. Yeah. Yeah. I think I can actually how do we show the yeah, I can delete this one. Uh Okay. Do do you do you guys think it makes sense, especially Catherine, if it makes sense to start a separate issue for further UX research to support this? Mm -hmm. Based on this these questions that we have here. So uh, underneath the magic moment, things like uh, that. underneath the number three for which users. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Why not? You might already have some data, as you said, but if, if you feel that you need more, yeah, I would say let's yeah. open an issue and do a bit more. Okay, I can do that. Yeah. Cool. So I'll write out a few next steps. I will start um, mapping out the current journey user journey next week wait it's Catherine with a K right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the UX search if needed look into existing data uh, and then maybe we can have another quick session in like two weeks. Uh, so next week, if I do the mapping, I can already come up with a few ideas what we could do. I'll do a bit of my research as well. In two weeks, maybe we can meet again. We can present, you know, some data and the current journey map and maybe just have a bit of brainstorming. What can we actually do based on the things that we find out? Yeah, sounds really good. Cool. That's, sounds good to me. I'll okay, continue to epic uh, a little bit uh, as well and, and drop in some of these questions in the epic. We can, we can, as we go along, please continue to add to that 
first epic um, that's in the sketch that's in the agenda, and we can uh, use that as the single source of truth for uh, for the scope here. But uh, all makes sense. Yeah, something that I'll do as well. I'll look into other somewhat similar products, how they approach onboarding. And if you have any cool ideas of good products that do it well, add them somewhere or just ping me on Slack and send it to me or whatever. Jeremy, you already mentioned um, Basecamp. I used Basecamp in the past, it's quite good. I haven't seen the new onboarding on WordPress. What did you write about that? Yeah, there it is. You can just click there and it'll show. I, it might be different now because I think that walkthrough is a little old. But um, nice. use, use, so useronboard.com is quite good. They have lots of teardowns. Yeah. So that's yeah. what I was referring to where they like will ask you what your goal is and then tailor a little bit based off of that. Mm -hmm. But in general, like I, the, the products I would be curious about looking are these like products with many use cases. So that's why like I concluded LinkedIn, like LinkedIn will like give you like a progress bar and ask you and like it, onboarding experience is not good, but I think that they have some interesting ideas that they try to explore. But in general, like applications where there's like lots of things to like customize and tailor, like Airtable is good because you can use it for a million different things. It's like, um, you know, Asana, like other, these like very um, flexible, you know, applications like ours, where there's like lots of things you can do and you have to like direct the user in a direction like early on. Um, use uh, products where like the, the, the um, you know, user experience is like very, very straightforward where it's like you need to get them to like, you know, do very certain things to see, to see value in the product, like not as interesting to me uh, because, you know, our, our needs are a little different. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and with that, I think that's it for today. And we're quite bang on time. Um, uh, um, there is one have any, Yeah, go ahead. Um, the point about um, people using the existing onboarding panel, the numbers of click-through rates, should that be a next step? Should, like, would we just request a tracking event for that? So I, I think that we have a lot of data. We just need to write down maybe the questions we need to answer. So one, um, maybe we could create an issue um, and add it to the Epic and um, just list those, those questions that we have um, and like use that as a single source of truth as we go. But I, you know, uh, I, I'm happy to open that. Okay. Um, but, okay. Do we need someone's help to look into that data or can we do it ourselves? Because uh, I know that we, so we far we have to do it ourselves. Okay, cool. The analytics team doesn't have a lot of capacity, so a lot of this we have to kind of manage ourselves. Tomas on the growth team might be able to help with some of it, so I yeah. will include him in that issue when I create it and we will see about asking him, but I might have to just query it for myself. Which is fine. Yeah, cool. I was going to ask if Tomas can help out because I know yeah, he's behind this already. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, let's see if we can do it ourselves. Otherwise, ask him. Uh, okay. That's it, I think. Any other questions? Any other comments? No, this is great. Thanks a lot for the session. Cool. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good start. I'll start working on it a bit more the next week. This week I'll focus on some other stuff, the SSO and all that that we need to <laughs> focus on currently. And should I schedule the next meeting? I think you scheduled this one, Jeremy, right? Yes, uh, if you could schedule the next one, that would be great. Okay. Um, okay. And also something I will like uh, leave the group with is obviously a lot of people at GitLab would be very interested in this. Um, so let's make sure that like as we have a direction and as we explore, just like share very openly with the rest of the company. We can talk about it in like the company call when we have something to share, but please share like openly in like UX, the UX channel and possibly in general as like we move along just to make sure that others are involved because I'm sure others will have lots of opinions. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. cool. Thanks everyone. Okay. And yeah, I'll see you in two weeks. Bye. <laughs> have a great day. Nice to see you all. See you. Bye. <laughs>